Ah, hello again, fellow hunters. Well, time to take a look at the final episode of review for the day. And it's my personal favorite episode from season one, Phantom Traveler. Alrighty. Begin at the airport. We see a very nervous man named George go into the airport bathroom to wash his face to calm himself before flying. Another man enters and tries to reassure him flying is safe. When this man leaves, a strange black entity emerges from the nearby air vent and goes into George through his eyes. Boarding the plane, the now possessed George gets on board his flight. The welcoming stewardess notices his eyes are all black, but shrugs it off. After 40 minutes into flight, George asks the passenger beside him the time. He then comments, time really does fly, before saying it's going to stretch his legs. The young man near the exit notices George heading for the emergency release handle and shouts for him to stop when he reaches for the handle, but somehow George manages to open the door and it blows off, hitting the plane's tail. The plane goes into a dive and we see everyone screaming in fear and panicking. Hey, I can see how that would happen. Anyway, early in the morning at the motel, it's 5.45 a.m. and Dean is awakened from sleep by Sam. Sam hasn't slept for a while now. He says what they do preys on his mind. Dean says he's never afraid like that, but Sam pulls a knife from under Dean's pillow and isn't convinced. Dean's cell phone rings, interrupting the conversation. It's a man Dean and their dad once did a job for in the past. He says he needs their help again. At the airport, Dean and Sam meet the man from the phone call in some kind of aircraft workshop. His name is Jerry, and apparently he had some kind of ghost problem once before at his home. This time, though, his problem is more work-related. He plays on the voice recorder of the downed airliner, and they all hear a horrid noise. Jerry says he doesn't think the plane had mechanical failure, which is what the authorities think. Apparently, there were seven survivors, including the pilot. Sam and Dean ask for access to logs, flight recordings, etc., as well as the wreckage. Dean says he can get them everything but access to the plane's remains. At the store, Dean goes to a copy shop and fakes two Homeland Security IDs. Sam is waiting outside, and in the meantime has checked out the noise on the voice recorder. It's clear now that something is saying, no survivors. At, at the psychiatric hospital, Dean and Sam go visit the young man who last saw George trying to open the plane's emergency exit. He's one of the seven survivors and has admitted himself into the psychiatric hospital because he's afraid of what he saw. He tells the brothers he knows it's impossible for George to open the exit as it had two tons of pressure on it, and yet he did. He tells them George <coughs> has strange black eyes, too. At George Phelps' home, Sam and Dean visit George's widow. They find his address and name from the flight manifest. George's wife tells him he was just an ordinary guy going to a dentist convention. This disappoints the brothers as they assume he might be some evil creature masquerading as a man. Outside, <clears throat> sorry, outside, the boys decide they need to check the wreckage to get any kind of clues for what they need, and for what they need suitable, <coughs> and for that they need suitable attire. They go shopping and come out of the store dressed in black suits. Dean says he feels like the Blues Brothers. At the warehouse. Sam and Dean gain access with their fake IDs and go out and go check out the plane's remains. They find an auto residue on what's left of the branch of the exit's handle, but when the real home secure, Homeland Security just appear and the boys have to make a quick exit, taking a sample of the residue with them. At the airfield, Chuck, the downed plane's pilot, is about to take his first aircraft up since the crash. It's only a small prop plane, but he's still very nervous as he waits. We see the strange black entity appear and seep into Chuck's eyes. At Jerry's office, the boy finds out the substance from the handle sulfur and concludes they're dealing with some kind of demonic possession. Back at the airfield, Chuck, planes take, Chuck takes the plane up and its nerves are strangely gone. After 40 minutes, the airplane crashes in, into, a, into a field near a place called Nazareth. At the motel, Sam and Dean look up demons in possession of their laptop. Sam finds... Japanese items stating that disasters are caused by certain demons. Dean says this is something bigger than usual and he wished your dad was there. The cell rings. It's Jerry and warned back news about Chuck's plane going down. Back at Jerry's office, the boys have visited the site where Chuck crashed and found, and found more sulfur residue. They realize that demon is using some kind of biblical reference because it's, caused, because it's crashing planes after 40 minutes of flight. It's crashed several over the it's crashed several years. Forty minutes apparently signifies death. 
I also figure it's going after all the survivors from the flight because they shouldn't have lived. Hey. Anyway, in their car, Sam rings the rest of the survivors to see if any plan to fly. Apparently only one does, Amanda Walker, the stewardess. The real problem is, they can't contact her and her flight leaves soon. Dean floors the gas and prays. At the airport, the boys arrive in, and Dean has Amanda paged. He tells her her sister has had an accident to try and stop her flying, but the ruse doesn't work as she had just gone off the phone with her sister. She goes aboard the flight and we see the black entity lurking. Sam says they have to get on the plane with Amanda and exercise the demon, exercise the demon or everyone on it will die. Diesel confesses he's very afraid to fly. Some offers to do it alone, but Dean doesn't like that idea. Yeah, I can see why. <laughs> anyway, on board the plane, Dean has given in and boarded the flight, but he's not a happy guy. He's obviously pretty scared. Sam tells him he has to stay calm. They only have 40 minutes to find who the demon has possessed. Apparently, it's, a, it's most likely to be someone uneasy or under pressure or stress. They think it might be Amanda, so Dean goes to talk to her. He says God's name in Latin, but it doesn't freak her out. She's not the one. Dean goes back to Sam as the plane encounters turbulence. And as the plane encounters turbulence, Dean, hit, Dean hits panic mode again. Sam calms him explain he has to be careful, as if he's panicking, he's wide open for demonic possession. The exorcism is in two parts. The first one makes the demon leave, leave the body has possessed, but also makes it more powerful could survive that human host. They must make sure they read both parts of, read out both parts of the ritual to banish it back to hell. Dean doesn't like the sound of this, but he uses his homemade Walkman spook detector to check out the passengers. He finds nothing. Then on 15 minutes they are getting nowhere, then suddenly the meter picks up on something. The demon is in the co-pilot. Sam and Dean enlists Amanda's help. They tell her the plane will go down if she doesn't lure the co-pilot to them. She missed something was strange on the original flight and tells them she saw George's black eyes too. Eventually, she goes to tell the co-pilot, still not really understanding what's going on. He arrives and the brothers try to subdue him. Sam recites the exorcism while Dean grapples with the demon, tossing holy water on him and fighting him down. The demon screams and knows what happened to Sam's girlfriend, Jess, but then is forced from the body it's in and the black entity vanished into the air duct. Immediately, the plane starts to take a dive and people begin to scream. Lights flicker as Sam drops the diary he's been reciting from. In the darkness of mayhem, he has to grapple to retrieve the book or everyone will die. The plane plummets and Dean is pinned to a wall, obviously terrified. Somehow, Sam manages to grab the book at the last minute and finish the exorcism. A huge electrical discharge flares around the plane and it levels out. The Winchester boys have saved the flight. Yay! At the airport lounge, people who are being tended to by paramedics are questioned by the authorities about what happened on the plane. Man and Mouse thanks to Dean and Sam as they walk away. Sam talks to his brother and is obviously upset, uh, and Sophie upset that the demon knew about Jess. Dean says the thing he knew. Dean says the thing knew his fears and probably lied. Outside, as the boys head for the car, Jerry thanks them for all they've done. Dean asks Jerry how he got his cell phone number, as he hasn't, as he, as he hasn't had it long. Jerry tells them their dad's voicemail. Points to Dean's number. This is surprised as last time they checked their father's number it wasn't working. Dean rings and hears the voicemail. This means their dad could still be alive somewhere, but why has any contact with them directly? The two drive off in their Impala as the screen fades to black. Hmm. So anyway, let's take a look at some trivia surrounding this episode. <clears throat> this is the first episode where Dean uses an EMF meter to search for evidence. It is also the prototype he built using a Walkman tape player before he built the smaller and more iconic EMF he'll regularly use. <clears throat> this is on PCP. Man, I don't care how strong you are. You don't want PCP. And we could open an emergency door on a flight. PCP, or fencyclidine, a recreational drug, can have effects of euphoria, loss of ego boundaries, aggressive behavior, and can induce feelings of strength and power. A different variety of demon smoke is seen in this episode. An insect swarm-like particle effect is used, where rather than the more condensed cloud-like appearance introduced in later seasons. This is only one of two episodes wherein only the iris of a demon's eyes are black and the sclera remains white. Second such being, uh, being Season 3, Episode 1, The, Man the Magnificent 7. Later in the series, demon's eyes are entirely colored. 
The holy water causes tissue damage to the host when it's used on the demon. In later seasons, this wouldn't be the case. The plane flying over Sam Dean at the end of the episode is an Air Canada plane, as the series is primarily filmed in British Columbia. While using the EMF meters to seek out the demon, Dean comes across a passenger who bears, bears heavy body modifications, which makes the meter go off. It's unknown whether this person bears any supernatural qualities. This is the only episode where demons possess people by flying into their eyes. In later seasons, the demons will fly into the mouth of a vessel to capture someone's body. In this episode, it was said that demons can possess <clears throat> only people who have a physical or emotional weakness. In later seasons, demons are able to, to possess any vessel that does not have protection. The use of crystal to make a demon reveal itself is only mentioned again in, in Season 14 episode, Optimism. This episode marks the first time the boys dress in suits and impersonate federal agents. There really was a Flight, flight 401 that crashed. Afterwards, the airline did, did salvage parts, and then passengers on planes that received parts started reporting seeing either the pilot or the co-pilot. Although the airline denied the planes were haunted, they did, event they did eventually remove those salvaged parts and the haunting stopped. This incident was made to a book and a movie, both with the same name, The Ghost of Flight 401. Ooh. And now finally, on to some errors. The Latin word for God is Deus, not Christo. Christo is Christ. Hmm. So overall, this is a pretty darn good episode. And like I said, it is my personal favorite from season one. And yeah, I could definitely relate to Dean with this. Well, I could kind of relate to, to Dean and his fear of flying, even though I don't have a fear of flying. I do have a fear of height. I do have a fear of height. Fear of heights, though, so, yeah. <laughs> so, overall, I give Phantom Traveler five angel blades out of five. Well, anyway, tune in tomorrow as we take a look at Bloody Mary. So, until then, carry on, my wayward sons and daughters.